Welcome to Gas, Poetry, Art, and Music. I'm your host, Belinda Subraman. So, uh, you're in New York City, is that correct? I'm in Brooklyn right now. Brooklyn. Fort Green. Oh, yeah. Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you mentioned in a note that you were a multidisciplinary artist. What other types of art do you do? Well, I've been an actor in theater and TV and film for um, about 25 years. Ah. And I went to, I graduated Juilliard in 95, and I've been working for, since then. Um, and I also take portraits, and I obviously have discovered this new weird talent of drawing <laughs> on, you know, photographs of uh, myself. So, huh? So the photographs that I've been seeing on Instagram, the ones you sent me, are yeah. those you've drawn on top of photographs on a lot of them, right? Those, on all of them. Oh, really? Yes, on all of them. They're all, um, I do self, uh, take a self portrait a day. It started as a self portrait a day. Um, that's how this all began. And at first I would just take a portrait of myself and then um, something happened called the art challenge that was going around during COVID where people were emulating uh, famous works of art. And um, so I did my versions of them as opposed to how everyone was doing the exact replica. I was twisting it a little bit and making it a little bit more political and thoughtful. And from there, um, I started to work with Frida Kahlo a, a couple of times. And I don't know what happened other than some porthole opened in my brain. And I said, start drawing on your photos. And I almost feel like she inspired me just studying her for the time that I did to uh, take a good portrait of her, of me as her. Um, it really just kind of took off from there. I started drawing on my portraits and then, wow. yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know that I could. <laughs> Well, it's really unique and it really catches the eye. And what Thank I get you. first first off is a great pride in yourself. Wow. Because it's all because you're beautiful to start with, but there's something about the way you present it is such pride. And why not? <laughs> I know, and I love that. I, I, I'll tell you, I'm fifty-two years old. Really? I, yeah, I'm fifty-two. And I think right now what's happening globally it's such a healing time for a lot of people and a lot of societal norms are being you know thrust about and belief systems are uprooting and um i feel in many ways that this has been a very healing time for me and doing the portraiture in this way has been more of it is a celebration of myself but it's a celebration of women of color everywhere or women of a certain age everywhere and being, you know, proud of who you are inside internally, that spirit. That's what I really try to capture in the photos, the spirit of that woman, not necessarily myself, but the spirit of the, um, you know, the creation because they're all based in women empowerment and, um, you know, just just really identifying with your own um, divinity as opposed to needing outside validation for that divinity. Right. Well, you and did a good job at that. <laughs> thank you. I hope I explained that okay, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, art is so relative. I, I'm, I'm convinced and have been so grateful for this time because I'm at a point where I don't care. I just want to do it. I love it. If you like it, cool. You don't, I don't care. Whatever. I'm going to keep doing it. It's brought me so much joy. And, um, you know, I get, to, I get to be in touch with the goddess every day, you know? Well, now, 
when you were in Juilliard, was that for your acting or another? Yeah, I was there for theater. So you, you have to be very talented to be accepted into that program. Yeah, you know, I know there's so many talented people that get in there and then five years after they quit acting because it's a really hard business. Mm -hmm. And you can go to a school like that and that doesn't guarantee you that you're going to get a job. So it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So if we, it, wanted, if we wanted to see some of your acting, uh, are you in any movies? Or um, I, if you go to, I, I'm on this show, called, I was on the first season of a show called In the Dark that's on um, Netflix and I was in a uh, series called The Looming Tower and another one called Shades of Blue. You know, I, I have done some work, but I never feel like I ever get a chance to really show what I can do, you know? Um, but in the dark, I'm in there quite a bit, okay. you know, but I, I, the roles that are there for people of color aren't I just am going to be doing my own thing for a while. I just need to be doing my own thing for a while. Good, good. Yeah. So go ahead. Okay, my name is David Trudell. I live in Victoria, Canada. And uh, this first piece is called Sepia Toned. And I wrote it a few years ago when it had been an extremely dry spring and early summer, and it seemed like the entire continent was burning with forest fires from... California to Alaska, and uh, our province was impacted as well. And I happened to be over on one of the, the neighboring islands, uh, one of the, what we call the Gulf Islands. And uh, we woke up uh, one morning and the sky was the most incredible color. And it was as if the world had turned into a sepia toned picture. And so this is the, the poem I wrote about it. Uh, and for me, it sort of marked that point, that tipping point when we talk about climate change, uh, that that was for me, the moment where we went over the edge. So without further uh, introduction here, sepia toned. We woke up sepia toned, not drained of color, but transformed into shimmers. Light lays flat, yellowed as yesterday's bloodied sun slips sideways on a once upon. We call each other, asking, do you see it too? And words like apocalypse, like end times, like otherworldly, filled our mouths as the sky filled our thoughts. Later, waiting for the ferry, I walk the beach, up to and under the dock, cross-hatched shadows feed the noontime reek of creosote, triggering memories of campfires. Then all I smell is the smoke of a carbon sink, a million trees candled in the wind, a burning world, riding thermals down every seaward valley on the coast until each wave pushes another dragon under. We try to laugh about how strange it looks as the sun reddens its shroud. Today is marked in black. This is the year when winter thins its cool. No matter how golden the sky seems right now or how wonderful splintered light appears slipping through ashfall. This is no celebration. This is not the same as other years when autumn slash piles stream pendants. Today is amber, a moment to hold long enough to remember how startled we once were. All right. You know, over the, I had an idyllic childhood. I was very protected and nurtured and it was a wonderful kind of a Tom Sawyer uh, adventure for me. And in later years, I've discovered that so many of my friends uh, were being abused. And uh, it's really uh, 
something that is a tragedy throughout history. And, and uh, it's little enough, but here's something that uh, allowed me to, to uh, express some of my feelings about that. And it's called Backseat Windows. As a child, I would lock eyes with other kids, captive in the back seats of station wagons, hurtling down freeways or slow rolling through clogged streets. I would lock eyes, trying for some kind of psychic connection, anticipating a future meeting, hoping that decades later, our eyes would remember a moment held between us briefly as a hummingbird's visit and just as sweet. When we were young, it was easy for me, seeing the world from inside the safety glass of the family car. Innocence was as easy as unlocked doors, knowing who lived in each house on the block and whose mother made the best cookies. I thought that everyone else was as safe as I was in those days before I knew about torture, about abuse and cruelty, punches that split skin, and the weight of undeserved guilt. Perversions frequent as autumn rain, for too many, too young, too terrible. Now, in this future of punched out walls, I wonder what happened to them. I try to recollect those faces, dredged images from ripped memories, some of those eyes must have been shrieking in their silence, calling for sympathy or salvation, locked in rolling hells, moving closer to the next indignity, while I worried about a music lesson I hadn't practiced for. If I could return to those moments, I wouldn't challenge fragile eyes with directness. I'd look at you obliquely and offer you my passing tears. I'd applaud you for carrying on, holding your head up as you looked out at a world that held more sins than miracles. I would unlock my eyes from the illusion. I would try to see your truth, not mine. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs>
glad you could join us today. Uh, since you were a lawyer for a long time, I was wondering, is there a connection between the reason you went into law and maybe the reason you write? Well, there's a connection between a, a big chunk of the work I've written and my legal work but I wouldn't say there's a connection to the reasons that I did either one of them. But once I got to law school, I discovered there was this whole area of public interest law that could be done, you know? And that was a lot more interesting and a big surprise to me. And um, I clerked for a summer on the Navajo Reservation, which was a high well, the high point of my life up until that time, I suppose. And it was just really fascinating and it made me feel good and I enjoyed it. It was, it, it was a rush. And then <clears throat> I went back to Austin to my law school and did some clerkships and internships with the legal aid office there. And, um, some other kinds of clinical work I did, and I just was was bitten by it. It was great stuff. I mean, there is nothing more rewarding than doing law that's actually useful to, to people who need your help, in my opinion. And then um, I had not started writing until my early 30s after I had left the reservation. Um, after I got back from traveling, I took a took a just a class at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque one summer, and and it just was addictive. I mean, I couldn't sleep after the first night, and got a lot of really strong feedback. It was really great, and then shortly thereafter, I moved to Santa Fe and got caught up in the writing groups that a lot of women had, um, starting Natalie Goldberg, um, Miriam Sagan, Judith Hill, Joan Logie, they would have these writing groups and we would practice writing and then read aloud. And then Joan Logie organized a couple of readings and once I read in public, I was just completely poetry slave <laughs> and I couldn't stop. Um, and when I first started writing, I was really writing about uh, poor folks from the Texas Panhandle, people who lived in mobile homes and were waitresses and went to beauty school and all, the kind of people I grew up with and the kind of people I would have been except for a little left turn to college. This first poem, A Neon Desert, The Only Sea, is in... Poemas Ante El Catafalco.
awareness moves to the right. Electric asters line a green sky. Brake lights baffle the eyes. Are you paying attention? Traffic moves to the right. Think of Louisiana. Think of Japan, Puerto Rico. People disappeared. Structures on stilts still can't outwalk the waves. Fissured world shifts in its sleep as sure as the earth beneath your feet. This may be the only world we know. Secrets and lies and camouflage. The stranger's smile, all teeth and eyes. Detainees in your backyard herded like cattle into the Coralon. Downtown old men still hide numbers tattooed on wrists or nopales inked on foreheads. Catastrophe is our only home now. Dying cougars shot more dead. Unknown bodies beneath the ground. Spying soldiers spread across the sky. A neon desert the only sea. Even metal's gone to driest dust. Hear the sound of air through shell. Scent of water glosses the lips of statues. Birds in treetops sing departure. There's about to be an accident. Our mama on the wall wears green and blue. She stands on the moon, blots out the sun. Birds gather in treetops praying for all the people dead and gone. Dancers dance with feathers and shells. Mama's starry cloak shelters her son with the no pal tattooed on his forehead. Pray for mercy. Pray for the woman who lives in a car, the detainees in our own backyard. Men with guns at every gate. People disappeared on the river edge, deprived of the solace of rivers and rocks. Our mama damp with migrant workers sweat. Lights wander the other edge of darkness. Nothing sure but this earth beneath our feet. Are you paying attention? Secrets and lies with teeth and eyes. This is your home now. Another day, another catastrophe. It's the only world we've ever known. Earthworks break into thunderclaps. Random red lights baffle the eyes. Birds falling from the dying blue. Lost fish floating in a dying sea. Yay, that's nice. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. 
act of suppression for William Wantling. Dragging a sorry-ass body to the studio, riddled with pain, I see there up ahead a yellow tiger swallowtail, flopping around on the pavement bizarrely, like something convulsing or someone improvising or a body working through a choreography. I know this isn't normal. I am intimate with this poet butterfly. It has made me aware. As I bend down and unfold the massive flopping wings, I see there the bald-faced hornet, beautiful and black, terrible and white, clutching the body with its desperate and powerful and elegant embrace, locked in the same brutal struggle. And I know this, never intervene. Don't do it, don't. Who knows which animal is more rare? Who knows what is beauty really and what is life and what is death? but I can't help it. I am exhausted and riddled with pain. I pry them apart and I feel better watching them fly off in opposed direction. A fistful of black soil. Here, look how our palm forms these clods, how the unmade loam crumbles back into us how we settle ourselves into our once forgotten earth. The white corkscrewing roots run down the whole length of our body and pull us deeper down, deeper down than waking, deeper in than sleeping dreaming, deeper among the disassembled ground of our own interior. Small things, dense things, burrowing things, Creatures worm back in, through, and out of our body, compose our body. We feel the warmth of our belly stone eroding the witless cry to be transformed. We rain, we thunder, we clear. We shake the last separate drop off our vestigial fingertip. We dream ourselves back into our saturated garden and we make it shine. And here comes the wildest first seeds blowing on a random wind. Stone, pain is a madness of the flesh, Albert Huffstickler. Today we have traveled deeper, together, beneath our doubled skin. It seems to us that we are fold together wholly because we are mortal and vulnerable and lost in the shadow of our common eye. I think we are looking in, not for the end of a thing, but for its unrelenting shape. We have the gravity of the round black hole in our belly or the blue black sorrow of our sluggish blood circling back. We have our muffled voice calling across the miserable rain Not tonight, love. Let's not succumb to the weight of solid and unrelenting words. Our appendage will become leaden with meaning. We sing the purest flowering and meaningless song. We walk the heaviness away. We forget by living under the awful pressing darkness of our bare embrace. Okay, my name is Paul Brooks. I'm a poet from Barnsley, South Yorkshire, England. And here's my poems. Our Empty Shelves. This Saturday morning in the shop, a glut of emptiness. Labels like headstones advertise what is missing. We wait on the delivery. It is late. No sugar, pasta, flour. We apologize to customers. Some in decorators face masks, others wear ordinary gloves, mouth covered by handkerchiefs like bandits in childhood cowboy and Indian films. Once delivery arrives, a joy to fill the spaces. Often in the same motion, customers take what you've just placed. Back off. Back off, she gestures with her surgically gloved hands. Away from me, back off, take a step back two meters. 
Aren't you listening? She pulls up me in front of my till. And to other customers in her queue, back off, I know what I'm talking about. Two meters, I'm a professional. I ask whether she wants change. Arms length, arms length. I stretch to hand a change. A long way round and patience. In the middle of serving a customer, a tall young man and a smaller woman burst over the no entry signs, stride towards my till, grey plastic packages in their hands. Post office, I ask. Yeah, replies the tall man. Sorry, please can you go the long way round? What? shouts the man. Trying to keep people safe, only following government advice. Government advice is bollocks, he replies, turning round and going the arrowed way. I apologise to my other customer, tell her folk find it hard, it's a long way round and patience nowadays. She asks, I need to go to the post office queue, do I have to join the queue outside? Initially I say she needn't, then thinking of others in the queue, perhaps it would be better if you did, I'm completely fine with that. The tall man appears round the corner, shouts, sorry about that mate. Perhaps the smaller woman had had a hard word on the long way round. I am speaking a social distance. I am the space, the silence, the weight between us, so often invaded. The self-isolator, I will keep myself to myself, maybe bake, spring clean, garden, again. I will not intrude, in fact. Specific duty, I will cover my mouth and nose, wear gloves in public. I will report myself and others to contact and trace. No lines. No lines to wait behind or folk to watch acutely for invasion of your space. No queues outside in all weathers ready for the nod to enter and by all those things you miss, like hugs and handshakes and the gentle stroke of understanding. No plastic screens raised against spit and infected water droplets. No arrows to follow one way around when we begin afresh, refreshed. Our justification for the gang rape and killing of your eight-year-old child is that, like you, she was not human and therefore not under the rights and privileges of humans. You must be tolerant of our beliefs if you wish to stay on our land. Because people killed further away do not grieve any less. A mother is a mother, even if her fashion is not ours. A father is a father, even if we disagree with his beliefs. An explosion is an explosion, even when on a flat screen. All right, uh, my name is Bart Solarchik, and I'm uh, talking to you all from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I have a few poems to read here, and I'm gonna start out with this one. <clears throat> uh, I wrote this poem after coming home from a, a, a late night party where at uh, one of my favorite places, the venues here called the Coffee Buddha, which was shutting down the night this was done on February 29th, since we had a leap year, it was their last night of existence. Uh, they had a band, a local band called the Hedonism Bots that I enjoy. And I was up there with a lot of people that I like. Uh, the week before that, I had done my book launch there. And uh, I ended up, uh, after I got home, I wrote this because it felt really good to get home. Even though I enjoyed the party, it felt good to get home. And this poem is called A Dog, A Cat, A Daughter. Home after the music in a 12-pack, he breaks bread like a peasant thinks Christ and bows his head, the wife watching TV, a dog 
a cat, a daughter. Giving thanks should always come so easy. Um, that was a happy and a grateful poem. And um, I had no idea that um, shortly after that, uh, on March 20th, <clears throat> I would have to put the dog to sleep that I had been talking about there. And on April 6th, my wife Tammy would pass away from a heart attack suddenly. So um, the next couple of poems deal with that. Uh, the first one here is called Tammy. Every inch a mile and every clock eternity, I miss you. I stay drunk. I'm on my way. And uh, it's been about three months now since Tammy passed. And uh, that's the name of this poem. And it's called Three Months Now. The side of my neighbor's house looks like a yellow brick skull with a green hedge beard and dirty window eyes. It watches past the driveway, watches me drink backyard beer, watches while I kiss the silver pipe, watches like it knows something I don't, but I do. Gone three months now, she's not coming back. This next poem and the last two actually are poems about friendship. And this was, um, I had a very good friend that was a barista at the Coffee Buddha, Megan Bell. And then she left to go up uh, and study in New York and get a master's degree up there in Ithaca and holistic healing and such. And um, we had been talking during the past couple of events at the Coffee Buddha. She had come down from Ithaca to visit. <clears throat> and it really made me think about the value of friendship. And I've learned even more about that now since Tammy's passing. And this is called Carried Where We Go for Megan at the Coffee Buddha. Beauty blossoms new each day if we fix our eyes to see it. Wisdom comes with age if we keep the door ajar. There will be pain, there will be loss. What we hold will shatter. But hearts bind in the dark, love follows light. Friends are folks we didn't know who arrive unexpected and never leave, carried where we go. And this last short one is another one for a friend of mine, my friend Nicole, uh, who recently dyed her hair purple and did a podcast, two things that she had been wanting to do. And she's doing some very interesting things, uh, coaching other women regarding feminine energy and such. So... I put together this last little poem because she's had her own kind of uh, issues to deal with. And it's called Purple Hair and Podcasts for Nicole. Pain shapes our paths in ways we'd rather not walk. Yet we arrive, voices breaking air, still sexy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
My name is Lawrence Barrett, and uh, I was born in Washington, D.C. I spent 20 years in the Army. Uh, I got out of the Army about 10 years ago, and uh, I've been just uh, hanging out, doing stuff, writing my poetry. Um, the, uh, p uh, the poem I want to read now is uh, called First Penthouse. Uh, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's Really, no introduction is necessary. Just, just, just some memories I've been having as I've been getting older. And, and um, here we go. Uh, first penthouse. Pink, <clears throat> excuse me. Pink fingers tremble without understanding. Nostrils breathe slow and suffer the demand of joy. For more joy and death of mind. Like high heels grinding wet heavens into flesh, screaming out, paths of least resistance. As muscles vibrate like higher consciousness, I come waiting, folded and filled, emptied and impotent, thick lips skimming pores of flesh, licking unimagined golden souls, bound and ravaged, dazzling and frivolous, all loosed in the fires of the sun, slam smacked, thrusting ache, shooting life, surging sweet musk, inside the prison gold of an earth grail body, still lusting for an Asian tigress of peak and swell, bursting areola contours, incendiary pulse above a sea of calm, so intense that the edge always overcomes, overwhelms, overfloods me like a spiritual drowning. And of course, one must drown to swim this pathway. I'll we'll close out the show now with a vintage piece by me called Beyond Meaning with the beautiful music of Ken Klinger and the art of Lawrence Barrett. <laughs> Beyond meaning. There's a seeming realness of grounded thought and an awkward fit of another human in our dream. We can share space and agree to be tolerant of illusion. We can agree to share some meaning in our lives. Meaning is the weight in our heads. It could be excessive rumination, the looped reels of life, or the invisible force behind our acting out, the dream that makes us crazy or calm, or sure of what could never be but is. Meaning is the assignment of the soul. We long for the fire of illusion that does not contradict our earthbound reality, but rides along on a higher plane, something that sparks the aura, tingles the essence, and sends vibrations through the cosmos. We long for the embodiment of love, torn between blissful numbness and the excitement of too much stimulation and weighted expectations, all for reasons we do not realize, are substitutes for what we cannot know.